2012, my family and I had the opportunity to move out to Bowie, Texas to receive a year's training at the Mission Training Facility. And one of the things that they told us was when you arrive on the mission field, you have to first be a learner before you can be a teacher. And of course, as a preacher, you want to go and tell everybody what you know, and tell them the truth. And uh, the simple, the, the reality is that when we arrived in Nepal, Asia, we were armed with all kinds of knowledge and education. And we thought we are ready to take on this challenge to bring the good news of the gospel to a pioneer field and uh, help the Tibetan people embrace Christianity. And we realized we were in for an education ourselves. One of the resources that I brought was a Bible study by Charles Brock. It was a simple series of seven lessons uh, from mostly the Gospel of John, talking about how Jesus came into this world and told about how Jesus is the way of salvation and just a very simple format. The thing I liked about that was it gave questions and each answer was simply found by reading a Bible verse and you could discover the answers to the questions. But one of the things that really opened my eyes was when you start talking about Jesus, well, who is Jesus? Why is Jesus the way of salvation? Why not Buddha? Why not Krishna? Why not one of the other 330 million deities that the Nepali people have uh, based on Hinduism? So I had to backtrack and look early in the Bible and I started thinking, well, what are the most critical stories that people need to hear to learn about God, to understand about man and sin and salvation. One of the things that they taught us at Baptist Bible Translators Institute was necessity for chronological Bible teaching. And uh, people like New Tribes Mission have come out with extensive Bible stories and other groups uh, have produced fine materials. And as I started thinking, this is something that we need to do if we're going to lay that proper foundation for people to understand the Word of God. So I started taking these concepts and started working through the stories myself. And what I came up with was a simple eight-part series. Through these eight stories, we can present the gospel biblically and chronologically, starting with Genesis 1-1. And in doing so, we can do a brief overview of the entire Bible in a relatively short time. I like to call it doing dot to dot with the most important Bible stories to connect the dots and show the picture of God's love and salvation for mankind. One of the first projects I began working on was writing a series of Bible stories in the similar format that Charles Brock had done with the booklet Good News for You. I started from Genesis and started working through the stories of creation and the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, the life of Christ and then relating it to the gospel and what we must do to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then where do we go after we die? Well, it's based on our decision of what we do with Christ, if we go to heaven or if we go to hell. These stories are simply called Understanding Bible Christianity. And it's very simply laid out. You have a question and then there's a Bible verse or a group of Bible verses that the student can read. And you can go through and you can go through very simply but yet thoroughly to understand the gospel from an historical and biblical viewpoint. You may freely download these eight lessons uh, from our website pilgrimoftruth.com. But as I was continuing to work on these lessons, I was given opportunities to do children's ministry and even teach Bible studies along with English in a Buddhist monastery. So I started simplifying these eight stories and you can see this in the series called Path of Life where we take each of these eight stories and present uh, these major concepts. In fact, these stories were so simple and yet thorough, I found that it was very practical to present these in village settings there in Nepal. And we would take a team of preachers and in 15 to 20 minute segments, we'd be able to work through these stories, working from Genesis all the way through Revelation to give, whether it's new, newborn Christians or whether it's Hindus that were just interested, but we were able to present to them an overview of the Bible and what God was doing in the affairs of man. These simple eight stories we've also been able to use in teaching right here in our Christian school. I've been working through these stories with our students and it's been phenomenal just to see the foundation being laid 
and being able to logically go from one step to the next in presenting who God is and who Satan is and what God's plan is to deliver man from his sin and then God's desire for man in turn to worship him. I also found that we needed to take these stories and simplify them yet more because there's many people that we will not have the time to present to them the gospel, yet, but yet we can give them a gospel track. And so I just took those major stories and simplified them and put them in a trifold gospel track called Five Facts About Life That You Must Know Your Eternal Destiny Depends Upon It. And here we just work through starting with creation and then where the Bible came from. And then we move on to who Satan is and when the first sin took place in the garden. And then God's answer in providing salvation and deliverance for mankind through Jesus Christ. And then the decision that we must make. What will we do with Jesus? Will we repent of our sin and put our faith in Christ? Or will we continue on our own way? And the destination depends on our decision. Will it be heaven? Will it be Today I would just like to share with you a brief synopsis of the Bible way to eternal life and this is just a chronological presentation of the gospel. So you will notice here on the first page that uh, we begin with the directions of life and this is presenting the Holy Scriptures. This is where we get all our answers to life's most important questions. It's God's Word that gives us the authority and we realize that God has spoken in the Bible. So we have this first picture that goes with a couple verses in Psalm 119, verse 105. The Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Isn't it awesome that the true God of heaven has revealed himself to mankind in the Holy Bible? In fact, this book is the best-selling book in all the world. And the Bible also says in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In God's Word, God tells us how we can know Him personally and live forever with Him. To know God, we must trust what He said to be true. So we find here that it's very important that we lay the foundation that everything we're going to learn and base our faith upon is God's Word. You will notice in the second picture here that this is the designer of life. Well, who is the one who has created life? Well, God, the true God of heaven, created all living things. As creator, God has complete authority over all his creation. And God has made man in his own image and desires to be known and worshiped by man and woman. Man has a will and can obey God. He commanded man not to worship anyone else. We must obey him. In Exodus chapter 20, we find that God is quite serious about this and he has given the command in Exodus 20 verses 3 and 4 and he says to his people, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. God also has commanded man not to lie, to steal, to kill, or commit adultery. In fact, if we break one law, we are guilty of all his laws. So we establish here that there is an authority and all power belongs to the omnipotent God who has created all things. Now we move into story number three, the deceiver of life. I bet you can guess who the deceiver of life is. Well, Satan is the one who rebelled against God. Because God made the world, we realize he is the rightful owner and he makes the rules. The devil influenced the first two people, Adam and Eve, to disobey God's authority. They were ashamed and afraid of God, but they could not hide from him. God had to cast them out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin. Every person born thereafter is a sinner. We find in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is tragic that sin has entered the world, but we realize this is the reason why there is sorrow and pain and death. And many people stop there and say, well, how could a good God allow that? Well, I beg to differ. God is a holy God. And we realize in the next story that God does punish sin, but he also offers mercy. So in our fourth story, we learn about the destruction of life. People became very evil from Adam and Eve and from their, their first son 
uh, Cain killed his brother Abel, and the imaginations of man's hearts became more and more increasingly wicked and evil and against God. And God said, I've had enough. And so he sent a great flood to destroy the world. But there was a man who was found righteous in God's eyes, and God showed him grace. And so we see that God showed mercy upon Noah and his family. And for a hundred years, while he was building this big boat from, through which God would spare his family, Noah was crying out and preparing and warning the people. And he was preaching the righteousness of God and inviting people to join him on the boat. And yet they scoffed him and mocked him just like they do today. But why did God wait? Why did God allow them to have so much time? Because God does love people, even though we're sinners. And the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, there is a payment for our sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. We all deserve separation from God. We all deserve to be cast into the lake of fire because of our sin. And God being a holy God does not look the other way, but he must punish all sin. So we learn that God must punish all sin, but he desires to show mercy to them that turn to him. And we find that Noah and his family, after they came off the ark, worshiped God, and they began to obey God's commands to spread abroad and, and to reproduce and replenish the earth. But as we always find is the case, there is always the deceiver, Satan, trying to deceive people and tempt them and lead them to believe that they can rebel against God, that they can replace God, that they can even make themselves as God. And here we find that false religion finds its way into planet Earth yet again. And we come to the Genesis chapter 11, where we find the fifth story, the dispersion of life. And this is where we find the Tower of Babel, led by uh, a mighty hunter, a mighty rebel, if you will, named Nimrod. And Nimrod sets himself up, sets his family up to be worshiped. And this is where we find the beginning of the worship of the moon and the sun and the stars. Really the worship of anything other than the true God who created this world. And we find that man cannot reach God his own way. You see, uh, the people led by Nimrod began gathering together. They were united in their defiance against God to build this tower that would lead up to the sky. And they refused to uh, honor God and they wanted to make themselves a name. So we see that the pride of man causes him to reject God's word to justify himself and to attempt to earn his way to heaven. But God will not accept our own good works in our man-made religion. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So now we come to story number six. We've established the fact that there's a God who has created us, who makes the rules and and God loves man, even though man has defied God's authority, man has rebelled against God and disobedience has sinned, gone his own way, and yet God still has reached out to man. Now we see that false religion is man's feeble attempt to try to reach God, to try to justify himself before God, but that's impossible. God had to come to man. God became a man. So what is God to do? Man has gone astray. Man has really made a mess of things. And throughout the Old Testament of the scriptures, from the time of Babylon all the way up to the time of the New Testament, God came up with a plan. And we see how he revealed that plan. We see a man named Abraham that God made a promise to. He said, through Abraham will I make myself known to all men. And he establishes a people for himself and that was the Israelite nation. Through the Israelite nation, God laid down the law, if you will. He gave Moses the Ten Commandments and uh, established great leaders to help his people follow God, to be reminded that they are to worship only the true God. Over time, the people became discontent with God being their leader. They looked around to the nations around them and said, we want a king just like them. So God gave them a king. It wasn't his desired will, but he gave them what they wanted and they did come to regret it. 
However, God, through his love and grace, raised up a king named David, and he made a promise to his people that through David's seed, he would establish an eternal kingdom. And through David's lineage would come a man named Jesus, who would be the eternal king come to earth. This brings us to our sixth story. Our sixth story bridges the gap from the time where man had gone astray seeking his own way to God and through false religion. And then God says, no, I will come and show you the way. And that was Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We understand that Jesus was born of a virgin. He was born without sin. So Jesus was 100% man, yet he was a 100% God who had taken on flesh and to show man the love of God and then to ultimately sacrifice himself for the sin of each person. Since mankind could not become pure by his own works, God sent his only son to pay our sin debt by his own blood. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, all according to the prophecies written down in the Holy Scriptures. And he lives with the ability to give new life, to save all those who call on him. Jesus Christ offers to forgive us and make us right with God. We call this justification. You see, it's a gift. It's something God provides and does for us. It's not something we earn. It's a gift that God freely gives us but we must accept it by faith. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this takes us to our seventh story. Our seventh story is the decision of life. This is where you and I come into this great story of what God has been doing throughout history. Remember, two main themes of the Bible is God delivering man and man worshiping God. God desires to deliver man from sin, from Satan, from death, and to give us life, to give us freedom, to give us hope, so that we can know God and worship Him. The decision of life brings us to the fact that there are two paths that we must choose. There is the broad path that leads to destruction. There's the narrow path that leads to life. And the Bible says that few will find that narrow path. So the question is, my friend, will you continue going your own way or will you choose Jesus Christ? The Bible says in Isaiah 53 verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. What is necessary for us to be saved? The Bible says very simply in Acts chapter 20 verse 21, Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the first part is our responsibility is that we must recognize we are going the wrong way. We are going away from God and we are headed toward eternal death. And that is a terrible, terrible thing. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ alone. He is the only way. There is no one else who can make us pure. There is no one else who can make us acceptable before the holy God in heaven. So we have a simple decision to make. Now our decision will determine our destiny. This brings us to our eighth and final story, the destiny of life. My friend, the truth is you will either go to heaven or go to hell when you take your last breath. This is a sobering thought. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friend, if you understand these simple facts, you may call on Jesus Christ right now and receive Jesus to be your personal savior. You may pray something like this, Dear God in heaven, I admit that I am a sinner and helpless to change myself. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose again to give me eternal life. I turn from my life of sin and receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Please come into my life and be my personal savior and Lord. In Jesus name I pray, amen. So you can see, my friend, it doesn't take very long to go thoroughly through the Bible, chronologically presenting key concepts about who God is, who man is, what sin is, and then who Jesus Christ is, being the only one who is capable of saving us and delivering us from our sin 
and the punishment from God. It is vital that if we're going to share Christ with others in a way that they can not only hear but also understand that we take the time to guide them thoroughly through the scriptures and point them to Jesus Christ who alone is able to save them. I hope some of these resources will be a benefit to you and if you would check out my website pilgrimoftruth.com and you may download any of these resources for free. If you would like to make a trifold track and be able to put your own church information on the back, I would be happy to work with you on that and you can get them printed and be able to put a thorough presentation of the gospel into people's hands. I would greatly appreciate if you would subscribe to my YouTube channel, Pilgrim of Truth. May the Lord bless you and enable you to be better equipped to be a thorough soul winner of the gospel of Jesus Christ.